Good evening and welcome to this evening's special presentation, How Do We Make UK Schools Safe? This evening's event is brought to you by Parents United in association with Long Covid Kids and we are delighted to be joined by Professor Jose Menares. Can I get the spelling of your name? <laughs> pronunciation uh, from the University of Colorado in Boulder. The professor is a chemistry professor who has studied aerosols over 20 years along with other experts in his field and is working to improve worldwide education regarding the significance of aerosol transmission in relation to the spread of COVID-19. Also joining us is a, a family member of Long COVID Kids, Sammy McFarland, is an entrepreneur and well-being coach and a founder of the campaign, which is currently representing over 450 families and growing daily. Both her and uh, her co-founder are long haulers and caring for children with long COVID, and they're keen to support other families um, who are needing to join their group. They're also petitioning the government for awareness, support and acknowledgement. Also joining us is Tony Dad founder of Parents United Against Unsafe Schools. Tony has 20 years experience as an applied statistician, which is gonna tell me I'm pronounced wrong, and started Parents United in May 2020 in response to the government's policy on the full reopening of schools. The campaign group of parents and carers is now over 23,000 strong and continues to campaign for a sensible, safe and sustainable approach to education during the pandemic. I am myself, Gemma Saul, and also Jenny Stowe, our admin members of the team there. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you everybody on Facebook. We will be handling a Q&A towards the end of this evening's event. So please do type your questions in the chat and we will pick some of them up at the end. First though, we would like to invite Pro Professor Hamiris to enlighten us on the importance of aerosol transmission in respect of the coronavirus pandemic. And I apologize, you'll have to tell me how to pronounce your name or I will keep getting it wrong. <laughs> It's okay. I, I, I've been in the U.S. for a long time, so I'm used to it. It's Jimenez would be a good, good way to say it. Well, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to uh, try to just explain briefly some what we know about, about the transmission of this virus and some tips about how to protect ourselves. And then hopefully I can do that in about 20 minutes so that we can leave uh, time for questions. And I was gonna use a few slides, but whoever is the host needs to allow me to share my screen or something that uh, the, the Zoom host needs to enable that. Um, yeah, I have made you co-host, so you should be able to do that. Uh, still telling me it's not allowed. So um, while, while you do that, I, I'll just mention briefly, um, I normally work on pollution and aerosols from other points of view. And since March of this year, um, I have been working on this. I, I, was, I was contacted and I contacted people whom I knew, scientists that work in, in this issue, and we contacted WHO and we have talked to them and I've been working on it for the last year um, with a lot of the world leaders in, in this topic. Um, <clears throat> and now hopefully you can see my screen. And then you say that um, there, are, there are, so I'm gonna talk about how we get how we get COVID and what, how we can protect ourselves from getting COVID. And then there is a number of links. I would say, if you want to see these slides, they are here, bit.ly slash COVID dash aerosols. And that will take you to a copy of these slides also with many more slides. And they have links to papers and things if anyone wants more information. And in general, what people want to know is how to protect themselves. And all the information is here, tinyurl.com slash FAQs, frequently asked questions, dash aerosol. And, and there you can find every, everything everyone ever asks me is there. Of course, it's much more, it's much easier to, to do a Q&A, but, but just, just so the information is there. Okay, so without further ado, let me, let me just say how this virus is transmitted. So it's, it's not transmitted through blood like HIV, as we all know, it's transmitted in three ways, like other respiratory viruses. It's transmitted through surfaces. If we touch someone's hand or someone's phone and, or, or a light switch or something, and they have touched, um, their nose before, and then we can get the virus. And then if we, after we touch those objects, we touch the inside of our eyes, the inside of our nostrils, or the inside of our mouth, we can get infected. Right? That's the surface pathway. And then there is two other pathways that go through the air, and they both involve basically balls of 
saliva or respiratory fluid that come out of us when we breathe, when we talk, when we sneeze, when we shout, when we cough, right? And they come into flavors, which is basically how big they are. The big ones, we call them droplets in this field or drops. And they basically are like a little cannonballs, like projectiles. They come out of us and they fly through the air and then they can infect you again if they hit you in the inside of the eyes, in this very small part of the nostrils or the inside of the mouth. And this is the droplet mechanism that still WHO and many governments say is the main one, which is, which is wrong. The main pathway is this other one, and I'll show you some evidence of it, which are also balls of, of, of uh, saliva and respiratory fluid that come out of us, but these are smaller. And they're so small that they don't have the inertia to cross the air and they don't fall to the ground like the droplets, but they float like smoke. Smoke is another aerosol. When, when someone's smoking, you expel it and you know, it gets stopped and then it floats around and you can breathe it in, right? That's, that's aerosol transmission. So I'm gonna say a few, a few things about, about how we know this. The first thing I would say is like, it's clear and there is no scientist that disagrees that transmission through surfaces is minor. Okay? So we should not waste effort disinfecting all the surfaces and having people come and clean all the schools with bleach. That doesn't accomplish anything. Simply, I mean, it's possible to get infected through the surfaces, but we simply have to wash our hands frequently, use, um, you know, Purell and kind of thing and avoid touching the inside of our eyes, our nose, or our mouth. But it's not easy to get infected that way, and that's not how the pandemic is being spread. Okay. So now, what do we know about transmission? For, from contact tracing, we know that a lot of people get infected in close proximity. That means, for example, when we're talking to someone close without a mask, especially without a mask, although if the mask is not very good, as we will say, that is also possible, right? So now, how is this interpreted? Okay, we get infected in close proximity, what's going on? So WHO has a video from, from almost a year ago now, where you see these projectiles, these droplets that leave this person, and then they fly through the air like little cannonballs, and they hit this person in the eyes, and that's how this person gets infected, right? That's their interpretation. You can go to the slides, and here you can see the video. And then later in the video, this person is further, so then, the droplets describe a parabolic trajectory and they land here and this person is not infected, right? This infection through droplets that again, WHO still tell us is, is the main one can happen, but it can really only happen if someone coughs or sneezes on your face. Then, then it's really possible, you know, that, uh, that you get infected that way, but that is not how the pandemic is being spread. You know, more than half of the spread is people who don't have symptoms at the time. And people are not coughing or sneezing on other people's faces. We are all too paranoid for that, right? So this is really, and it's, you have to protect yourself from that, but it's not the major pathway, right? Um, what, they, what they forget conveniently is that infection in close proximity can also be explained through the aerosols, right? And maybe this image is the best. This is a simulation, but there are measurements that look similar. And you see here a person that's talking and then like smoke, the air, you know, comes out, but then it stops, friction with the other air stops it, and then eventually it tends to rise because it's warmer. Now this person is keeping a good distance, so they are not gonna breathe a lot of the virus that's coming out in these little little balls of saliva here, right? Now, if this person was closer, or was here, they will be breathing out a lot of the air that's coming out. Or um, another way to say it is, for example, if you are, if you are smelling the garlic on someone's breath, that means that you're inhaling the air that they're exhaling with very little dilution. That's a really dangerous situation in close proximity. If you keep your distance, you breathe naturally less of the air that they're exhaling and you're safer, right? And we believe that's the more correct explanation of why distance works. But we need to keep our distance. Distance works very well, right? So as much distance as you can indoors and outdoors, okay? So then, um, so you, just to remind um, ourselves, so then basically the, the, there are two situations in which we get a lot of transmission. One is if you talk to someone very close, like I just said, right? If you're breathing here, here, this is smoke that's visible. The, these respiratory aerosols are too few, so they're not visible, but, but they behave in the same way. So if you breathe this air that's coming out of someone very close, that's very risky if that person is infected. But then, you know, just like in a room where there is a smoker, at the beginning, when they light this, the cigarette, you may see the smoke, but after 10, 15 minutes, you smell it, right? Because the air mixes through the room, right? 
And for example, in this room where, where this person is smoking, this person is, is a, a good distance away. But if the room is not well ventilated, the smoke will accumulate, the smoke will accumulate, and this person will breathe enough to smell the smoke or to get infected when we're talking about the virus aerosol. And okay? so this is, um, and this is why we need to do ventilation is this situation when we have many people in a room, like in a school, right? And this is what's not being communicated very well in many countries. Okay. So what else do we know about, about transmission? And it's again, another, another tip that we, can, that we can put into practice is, we know that indoors is much, much, much easier to get infected than outdoors. Okay? And there are studies, for example, this is a study in Japan that was summarized by the Financial Times in which they follow people who were infected and had already, by the time they caught them that they were infected, they had already met with other people. And 22 had met with other people indoors and 88 had met with other people outdoors. Okay? So the 22 who met other people indoors, six didn't infect anyone and 16 infected someone, right? Now of the 88 that met with people outdoors, 77 didn't infect anyone and 11 infected someone. So you see, this is completely lopsided. It is, my, it is possible to infect someone outdoors, but it's much harder. It's much, much easier to infect people indoors. And when we look, okay, of the people who infected someone, how many people they infected? So we see indoors, you see, you start to see three, three, two, two, four, nine, twelve. You start to see cases of super spreading, right? While indoors is a lot, outdoors is a lot of one, 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 you know. So really to get a lot of people infected, every single case of super spreading that we know about, like the choir that I will tell you about in a moment, they are all indoors. So that's another, and, and again, these projectiles we don't care that you're indoor or outdoors. This is because the smoke is trapped by the walls, the ceiling and the, and the floor. Yeah. Okay, so then the last bit I will tell you is super spreading, right? So this is a virus that's, that's very uneven. There's a lot of people who are infected and then they don't infect anybody. You know, They're infected even at home or whatever and they don't infect anybody. They're not very infectious. And then there is, or they are lucky that they don't share the air with others. And then there is some people, the, a minority, who then infect a ton of people, right? The super spreading events. And you have seen this in the news, the restaurant in China, the bus, the choir. I mean, there's, there's so many uh, that, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you've read many, many of these. I'm gonna talk about the choir in Skagit County in Washington, the US. So this is a case that, that happened in March 10th. And in my opinion, is the clearest case of the pandemic. We, we contacted the journalist who published it in the Los Angeles Times, and he put us in touch with the choir. The choir has done everything in their power to help us. And they told us exactly what they did, and we went back with lots of questions. And we published a paper that has all the technical details, but let me tell you the, the brief story. Basically, this is a choir in a rural region, and it's not, they are not social with each other. They don't see each other during the week. And they come for the choir and they are very structured, you know, so they come just in time, they sing, sing, sing. Then they pause for 10 minutes during which they, you know, they chat, they go to the bathroom, they maybe eat something, and then they sing, 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 and then it's late and then they leave. Okay? And out of 60 people who showed up, normally there will be 120, but they knew they had COVID in Seattle that's nearby, so fewer people showed up. So they were, they were more distant than in this picture. That's actually a different choir. And, and nobody touched each other because of the impact, the, um, all the emphasis on surfaces early on. So nobody touched each other's hands, nobody gave the, each other hugs. The doors were brought open, they had, they had Purell for their hands. Um, and, and basically after a two and a half hour rehearsal, 52 people get infected, including people who were 13 meters behind, or how much is that, 34 feet behind the person who later was known to be infected, right? So it's a pretty spectacular case. And this structure allows us to, to see how they got infected, right? Could this be the surfaces? Well, they, the CDC has been telling us for months that this is inefficient, as I told you earlier. And they knew that there was this emphasis on surfaces, so they didn't touch anything. And then the person that later was known to be infected, the index case, didn't touch anything except she went, this person went to one bathroom where only three other people went. Right, so impossible to infect 52 that way, right? Could it be these projectiles, these droplets that, that hit people in the eyes or in the nostrils? Well, there was no one in front of the index case. So when the person was singing, these droplets, these projectiles wouldn't fall on anyone. 
that person didn't talk to anybody. And on average, in the 10 minutes, they said, well, each person will talk to two or three people because you're gonna have to go to the bathroom, whatever. So the and CDC tells us that you have to talk to someone for maybe 15 minutes to impact enough droplets. So it's impossible that in 10 minutes, someone talked to 52 people. It just doesn't correspond to what happened, right? So, so basically it's impossible that, that people got infected one by those ways. What explains it easily? These aerosols, the persons were singing, and singing puts a lot of aerosols, a lot of virus in the air. And then the air in the room is well mixed. There was low ventilation, and everyone was breathing in this virus for two and a half hours, and 52 people got infected. And even when you look in more detail, it's consistent with the restaurant in China and all that. This is one example, but every example I have colleagues who have investigated others, and basically every example that anyone has looked at fits this pattern. There is no study I know of of any super spreading event that people have convincingly said it was the surfaces or it was these big droplets, projectiles. Every single one points towards these aerosols, towards this smoke, right? And we know that 20% of the infected infect 80% of the new generation of infected. This is this dispersion of the disease, right? So super spreading events are very important and they are only explained through aerosols. Okay. So anyway, so that's what I wanted to say about how the virus is transmitted, which already gives you clues about how to protect yourself. Yeah. And I'm gonna, you know, say a few more things about, about how to protect ourselves, and then we can we can um, see which questions people have. So we have made some, um, you know, I mean, I haven't. People, volunteers have done different posters trying to communicate what to do and what not to do, right? And these are again on the web, and you can make your own. Um, but basically, we have to avoid places that are crowded indoors with low ventilation, where you are near other people, when you cannot maintain distance for a long time without masks, and when people are talking, singing, or yelling, because this puts much more virus in the air. When we made this poster, people said, you just described a school. And it is a school, I mean, to, to a good degree, right? And, and the school is inherently a risky situation. There has been, I mean, I'm not an expert on the schools, but I've been following the debate, and I would recommend uh, following, for example, Dr. Zhou Hyde on Twitter, who's uh, an, an epidemiologist from Australia who has been doing a lot of work in this area. And um, and what they, what I mean, there's been many governments, like I'm familiar with, with efforts, for example, in Spain, and I think the UK, that to say, no, no, schools are safe, in the schools they, we don't have transmission. And in reality, this is a decision, like some of you may remember the Iraq war, where the decision was made to invade and then it was justified in public, right? Oh, they have weapons of mass destruction, but the decision had been made and then everything else was defense. So here the, the decision has been made for political reasons to keep the schools open. And then there has been a denial that transmission happens in the schools. And there was a case in, in Hamburg, I believe in Germany, where there were 30, 30 students in a school got infected and the authorities said, oh, no, 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 this, they, they didn't get infected at the school, they got infected elsewhere. But then there was a genomic analysis that was kept secret, but then was um, through a request to the state, they had to make it public, which showed everyone had the exact same virus and they had gotten infected at the school, right? And the same is happening in other places, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it's possible, it seems confirmed that little kids are less contagious than adults. You know, once they get to be teenagers, then they are equally contagious, you know? But even though they are less contagious, the little kids, they spend a lot of time together and they touch each other more. They, they have more trouble keeping their distance and keeping the mask. So, so it's a risky situation. There is no, no way around it, especially with the new, the new variant. Things that we can do well, av avoid all of this to the extent possible. Do as much as we can outdoors. As with outdoors, there is much less transmission. Outdoors with distance and with a good mask really is short of a staying at home. It's a, it's a very safe thing to do. We do have to wear masks, including at schools, and we have to think about ventilation and filtration. Okay. So I'm gonna just say a few more things. You know, people say and in the UK it's cold, in many places it's cold in the winter, and they say, oh, it's, it's too cold to do anything outdoors. And it's like, well, in 1910, there was an epidemic of tuberculosis, and in Boston and New York, they did the school outdoors all winter. You know, and the kids just, just had more clothes. And the reports of the time is that the, the kids were, were actually doing better. They were saying there was there was some quote that uh, some kids that were not showing any interest of li in life, then suddenly they started being much more awake. So, you know, this cannot be done every day in every place, but there are always some days with good weather or some times of the day or something. So as much as possible, do things outdoors or see if you have to meet other people, meet them outdoors with a mask and that, that would be a lot safer. Um, 
then um, ventilation. Ventilation means the air that's indoors, we put it outdoors, and then we take air from outdoors that doesn't have the virus, right? And this works for diseases that, that are transmitted through aerosols. It hasn't been published yet for COVID because just, just these things take time, but there is a case published this year in Taiwan for tuberculosis, which is a disease that's also transmitted through the air like COVID, but it's less contagious actually. It's, it's a slow disease, it's less contagious except people are contagious for a long time. You know, that's how it survives as a disease. So what is this graph showing? This is a function of time, you know, it's happened in 2010. And this was a dorm in Taiwan, a, a university student residence, right? And they start to see cases of tuberculosis that start appearing. And then the university notices in Taiwan and they, they realize that the, the CO2 level, the amount of exhaled air is huge and the ventilation is very low, this number, right? And then they send the engineers, they greatly enhance the ventilation of this dorm. And then the ventilation goes up a factor of 15. The CO2, the exhaled air goes from 3,000 to 600. And the outbreak extinguishes itself. There's still some cases that probably it's a slow disease, so they have probably been transmitted when they have the low ventilation, but it goes, it goes away, right? So you suppress transmission, right? This works also for COVID and WHO and CDC and everyone says ventilation is very important. They don't explain why, which is really makes it really confusing, but but top people at WHO have videos saying you will have to do ventilation, it's just they don't tell us why, but it is for this reason. <clears throat> Okay, so, and, and we have to open the windows and I'll say, or, or until however we can, I'll say a little more in a second. We also have to wear masks. Masks are filters. A filter is just a piece of cloth that as these aerosols that have the virus come in, many of them will stick on this filter, right? And so there, and there are two things that matter about masks. One is the quality, you know, it need to be, if you cut a t-shirt and, and you tie it on yourself, it does something, every mask does something, but it's not as good as you can get, you know? a good cloth mask with, with three layers, or you know, an N95 or a K95 mask is a lot better. But so there's the quality of the mask, but what also matters is the fit of the mask. And this is a forgotten thing. You, I walk on the street or I see people and I always see ma gaps around the mask, especially here on the nose. And this is a test that was done by a colleague of ours in the Netherlands showing, so they have a mannequin that was exhaling some smoke and then they put some masks, but they didn't put them very well on purpose. And you see in this case, with a surgical mask, a lot of the smoke came out there and there, and you can see the video in, in YouTube there. Now this is a KN95 mask, supposedly very good, but it, it's not well adjusted. They didn't do an effort of, of adjusting the, the piece of metal here. And again, you see a lot of this smoke coming out. Now this is a cloth mask, but it's bigger and it, it seals very well. So with this one, you couldn't see any smoke. So in this case, this is actually the better mask. So, you know, if we could all spend 10 minutes looking at the mask we have and seeing which one fits better and maybe have your husband, do I have a gap, whatever, whatever, this would be invaluable, right? Because we know the virus gets trapped both going in and coming out of us. Yeah. One thing, I mean, that is, has been very confusing and you will hear people, oh, masks don't work because the virus is very small. And then the, the gaps in the mask are huge and the virus is going right through. This is totally wrong in multiple ways. First, they think that uh, that a mask is like, um, I forget now the English word, that, that is basically the, the, the aerosols have to get stuck. And if the hole is bigger, they don't work that way. The, the microscopic filtration is very different. You have to think that it's like a spider web and it's sticky and, the, and, um, and masks filter a lot better than you would think that way. The other thing is that the virus is not there naked. This is an image actually that was published by the Journal of the American Medical Association, and that is completely wrong. The virus doesn't do this. The virus is coming out in, in these balls that are, that are big, much bigger than the virus. They're still small enough to float in the air and do the things we said, these are not the projectiles, but they're much bigger than the virus and they're easier to filter with a mask. And this is really where we think the majority of the virus is. Now for ventilation, in the winter, of course, there is a, you know, the way I open the window, but then it's too cold. And then, so they, there is a trick that we have discovered with, with other scientists, which is to measure carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide, CO2, it's outdoors. There is about 400 parts per million. That just means of out every million of molecules, 400 are CO2 and the rest is oxygen, nitrogen, it's a matter. So think just about the number 400 or 400 and something. And this is in Boulder. So it was written 445 with this little meter. And um, 
what happens is humans excel CO2. And if you are, for example, I'm here and, and I see, you see my meter, it says 965. That means, you know, one and a half percent of the air that I'm breathing, I'm breathing for the second time. You know, 800 is one percent cent. Many schools are at several thousand, you know, and if you are at 4,400, for example, that means 10 percent of the air that you're breathing, someone else has already breathed it and exhaled it. And that's the dangerous situation, right? So, I mean, and we measure CO2 because we cannot measure the virus, but it's super useful. And this is an, an example I did on my car. We went on the car and in half an hour with the car all closed, we got to huge numbers. We were rebreathing 10% of the air, which can actually be dangerous for other reasons. And then we just started the ventilation system, bringing air from outside, and we got to a much more decent number. So we are recommending that people get these meters. I mean, these are, there are a number of brands and we have a document on the web that, that says which ones we have tested. They have to be of this NDIR technology, non-dispersive infrared, because they, they, they sell cheaper meters that only will cost you 20 pounds or whatever, but those don't work, unfortunately. They don't measure CO2. You need these ones that cost between $90 to $200 and whatever the, the changes in, in pounds. Okay. Um, okay. So now, we, once you are armed with one of these, and you only really need one per school, because you can then measure, they measure in five minutes, and, so this is in a school in Spain, a colleague of mine, I mean, in this case, they had one in, in a class. And this is two different days where they open the windows differently, right? If they didn't have the windows open, there will be several thousand. But because they had the windows open, you know, for example, in the blue day, they were hovering around 700, which, which is what we're saying, this is, this is safe. Then they go outdoors and it goes up. Then they come back and then it goes, it goes up again. And then they stay around, you know, so this is a safe condition. And this was achieved opening three windows, 15 centimeters, right? So you, they didn't have to open all the windows completely. People find over and over that you can not be too cold, you can keep uh, thermal comfort, and you can open the windows enough. And they need to be open continuously, but not completely, just a little bit. And only when people are there, you know, in some places they are, they are opening the windows when people are not there, that's wasting energy. That doesn't accomplish anything. So. Um, so that's that. And this trick can be applied to other cases. This is a, an airplane trip between Spain and the Netherlands that a colleague of mine did. And, and here you can see this is in the bus. And this is, so this is the concentration versus time over a period of six hours. Here's in the terminal, those were well ventilated. When they boarded the aircraft, this is the tunnel in the aircraft and inside the aircraft. That was, you know, because they don't have the ventilation on or the tunnel doesn't have ventilation. And that's actually a pretty risky environment. You are sharing the air with the other passengers. Then once you go into the flight itself, yeah, the, the aircraft is, is pretty ventilated. So unless the person next to you removes the mask, something is, is reasonably safe. Another person got out of there really quickly and then went outdoors and then took a train, you know. But you can see how you can, you can examine many places. And we have a hashtag on Twitter, COVIDCO2 altogether, where and we, we've donated, um, I think by now 40 or 40 some of these meters for different people. And, and um, we highly recommend it. And, and there is a group in Australia, they call themselves the CO2 gorillas that was started by a medical doctor. And they basically loan people meters so they can take them to their work and they can, because we have to hold the institutions accountable. They don't want these measurements done because they make, because they make people realize that, that they don't have enough ventilation. Okay. And then the last thing I'll say is if, um, if you cannot do ventilation, for it's, it's a basement or whatever reason it's too cold, it's north, north of Scotland, then you have to f do filtration. And filtration is like the mask that we wear, but instead it's in a box. Air comes in through with a fan instead of our lungs pumping the air. Here is the fan, pumps the air, goes through the, through the filter. The virus stays here and it will lose infectivity and clean air comes out. So these are what are called portable HEPA filters. They work very well and they have one problem that they're expensive, right? I've, I've gifted a couple of these to my kids' school, but you know, they, they are, the money adds up in, when you're thinking about a big school. But there is another way, which is very popular in the US and in China, I don't know, I haven't heard so much in the UK, which is to take a fan of the type of fan that you use so you are not hot in the summer, and you basically attach one of the filters that you will put in, in, in their heating on their conditioning systems and with tape or with, uh, I think this is with rubbers in this case, they, they attach it. And this works use can work used as, as well, but it costs the tenth. This costs five hundred dollars. This costs fifty dollars. You know, so if the governments were responsible, they were putting one of these in. They would be putting one of these in every classroom. There is many 
I have colleagues who have put them in their own classroom. There are schools doing this. There are teachers doing this. It, it should be an organized uh, thing. And, and here, for example, there is some data from a colleague in the University of Spain who has done a lot of tests. I mean, this, this does work and it's proven. Um, one last thing, I guess, uh, one more thing. Uh, the louder we talk, the more aerosols we, we produce, right? Because we produce the aerosols as we breathe, as the air goes over the vocal, the vocal call, the vocal folds, vocal cords, or when the air is over the P, the T, or whatever, that's when we put little balls of saliva in the air. The louder we talk, the more aerosol and the more virus, presumably, we put in the air. So what to do, for example, whenever you can talk less loudly, if you can have a microphone so you don't have to yell, that's better. If you are in a bar, lower the music or, or you know, forbid the music in the pub so people don't have to yell. You know, there's a lot of outbreaks in, uh, in bars where people have to yell or in these choirs where people are singing loudly. I have not heard of any outbreaks in a movie theater or in a library where people are very silent and not moving, right? So anyway, there's, there's studies of that. So anyway, so that's hopefully that was that was useful. Just to to summarize things again and to remind you this bitly COVID aerosols. You can find these slides and many more with all the links and everything. And this FAQs aerosol is has the frequently asked questions with what people tend to ask about how to what's going on and how to protect ourselves. Okay, thanks. And and I'm happy to take well, I guess now Tony is gonna present and then we'll have yeah. questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That was really enlightening. And yes, we will come to questions. Um, here he is. He's popped back. He's decided to come back. Um, so yes, we'll have a short presentation from Tony um, and then we'll pop on to questions. Great. Wonderful. Um, and thank, thanks, Jose, because, um, uh, you know, we do agree with you that it was a political decision. We do think the role of aerosols has been underplayed. We've been talking about aerosols right from the start of this campaign. Uh, and it's really important that people get the message that um, these type of environments that schools, particularly in the UK, with crowded classrooms and lots of children in a small space with lack of ventilation uh, are, are fairly dangerous places. I was also really interested to hear the story about the, uh, which I hadn't heard before, about the German school. Uh, where they linked the genetic sequences. So I've got a bit of background in genetics and statistical genetics um, back in the, um, uh, the first decade of the century. Um, and obviously there's, I mean, that is pretty much proof that they caught it from each other in that environment. Um, it's very difficult to prove anything in this, in this arena if you don't have that kind of detail of evidence. Um, and what I'm gonna present is some correlational uh, work and just patterns in data. And Gemma, my uh, able assistant, is going to present for me, isn't she? You're going to pre present my slides, Gemma? Wonderful. Um, and I've always wanted to say this. Next slide, please. Okay, so the ONS uh, infection survey is the largest, uh, uh, more or less random sample of people of all ages in the UK, and it's been running uh, a long time. Uh, so they uh, send out uh, uh, swab tests to uh, uh, people and they of all ages, and they send them back and they're analysed. So this picks up the asymptomatic cases, as well as the symptomatic cases. And we, we've started this graph at, uh, at the start, more or less the start of the UK school term. Scotland went back a little bit earlier. Um, and it's split into the age groups that the ONS uh, infection survey reports it in. Uh, and the first thing you see uh, at the start of September or in the middle of September is the green line, which is school year 12 to age 24. So this covers, covers sixth formers in the UK uh, and also um, university students and, and other, other young adults. And that goes up very sharply, very quickly in, in September, in the middle end of September. So that combines uh, sixth formers and university students. And we know there was a problem in universities. The red line is school year seven to school year 11, which is a uh, senior school in the UK. And, and that is the second biggest increase uh, that, that starts at the end of September. And then we also have the other uh, relevant line for us is the yellow line, which is uh, age two to school year six. Now, generally in, um, in, in swab tests, these, these, uh, th these ages are, are underrepresented 
uh, and the, we, we, should, we should trust the ONS infection survey that the swab tests were done correctly um, and because it's very difficult to swab young children, as I'm sure you appreciate. And they go up slightly more slowly. And the purple line is the next age group up, group up. So that's young adults, 25 to 34. So we see a, a, a big rise um, that starts about two or three weeks after schools go back which you might expect if the schools were um, uh, a super spreading incidents. Uh, and then we get to half term, which is uh, a varying time to, uh, across the UK, but is um, generally at the end of October. Uh, and, we, and we see a slight dip. And then some restrictions were introduced uh, in the UK um, uh, in uh, early November, and we see some more dips. And when those restrictions were lifted, there's a massive rise again and particularly in the school age children, including the uh, primary age uh, children, the yellow line. Uh, and then we get to the end of December and they start to drop off again because they're not at school. That's our hypothesis anyway. So next slide, please. In the first half term, so from mid-August to the end of October, Gemma spent many, many, many hours uh, dedicated time uh, collating reports that were sent to us on Twitter and through Facebook and on our in our group on Facebook too, um, of uh, uh, incidents reported in local papers. Now, the reason why they're local papers is that the national press didn't seem to be very interested in this topic. They weren't interested in the number of schools that had at least one or two cases, um, positive cases. And you can see that they're spread far and wide and we get to a total of 3,578, which is uh, greater than 10% of all the educational establishments in the UK. We know that's an under-reporting. We, we tried our hardest to get all of those reports, but it was a, a labour of love. And we, we know from other, um, uh, other, other uh, people that collated uh, these incidents too, um, that there were at least 20% of schools and probably far more had these incidents. So that's another piece of evidence that schools are a driver of this. Next slide, please. And then we have the ten attendance statistics. Um, the, this covers um, the period of March to uh, March 2020 to January uh, 2021. Um, and um, we can see that the attendance in uh, the weeks, uh, later weeks of the year, uh, starts to uh, drop off and there's more absenteeism. And so we get up to about a third of pupils are actually off school, I think this means. Um, and the uh, next slide, please, we focus in on the last few uh, weeks. So this is week 50 and 51, where it really uh, just less than 30% of, of pupils, a uh, proportion of, sorry, proportion of state school pupils with month, one or more pupils self-isolating due to COVID. So we know by the end of the uh, autumn term, just before Christmas, there was a, a, a huge number of schools that had these incidents happening. Next slide, please. PHE also report, Public Health England also report outbreaks in educational settings relative to other settings such as care homes. Uh, and this, this period covers the last four weeks of the year. Um, so it covers a, a week or two where they weren't actually in school. Um, and we've seen in previous periods that the uh, number, of, uh, number of cases in educational settings was even higher than this. And it's similar to the number uh, that are in uh, workplace settings, such as offices and factories and things, uh, I think, uh, and but uh, uh, far less than in care homes, which have a particular problem, of course. So schools, educational settings themselves, which are, are both schools, nurseries and universities and colleges, uh, they do have a lot of incidents we observe. Next slide, please. And this is summarised in a, a different form, a bar chart from PHE, where you can see uh, week 36 or 37, 35, 36 is when they went back to school in September. And then the grey line is educational settings, the grey bar. And you can see that that immediately becomes extremely important. Before then, there weren't actually that many, um, there weren't actually many cases in educational settings because they weren't open, but immediately the as schools and universities went back, we, we detect them and there's a, a, an important and a rather large proportion of 
cases in those settings. Um, data, exclu data excluded from Wales there. Uh, next slide. And while all this was going on, there was pressure to send your child into school uh, under punishment of fines, threats of fines uh, and other, uh, other measures. Um, and one of the things we found in our group over the, the course of the year is there are many uh, households where there's a clinically extremely vulnerable uh, adult or child or other, uh, or, you know, parent or grandparent um, who may not wish to take the risk of the child going to school and bringing home uh, the virus. Uh, and they were, they, they are still being threatened with fines. To, um, and we, uh, we do have a, uh, a, a strand of our uh, campaign where we uh, have a barrister, uh, Mark McDonald, representing us and a solicitor from the Public uh, Law Centre um, who are um, following up these cases. Uh, and uh, Mark has uh, offered to go to anywhere in the UK uh, to support anybody who's uh, brought up in court and challenge the fines. Uh, and we think this is, um, we think this is a scandal actually, that people are being uh, forced to attend school even when there's a clinical vulner vulner vulnerability. Next slide, please. Uh, and in September, this was quite a, quite a common theme uh, that in, in our group too, that uh, people pointed out that if parliament wasn't safe for, uh, for, for MPs to do anything but uh, attend in very restricted numbers in the debating chamber, um, the reality is in schools, um, although we, we were told that they were COVID secure uh, and all the pictures in the media um, appeared to show empty classrooms with very few pupils in, uh, the reality of schools are that they are very crowded uh, environments. And as the NEU has pointed out, we have the largest class sizes in Europe and the smallest amount of space per pupil. Uh, and we think that that is contributing to the, uh, the, the disastrous situation that we have in the UK at the moment. Next slide, please. More pictures. I think we finish off with more pictures of, of real schools to counteract. Uh, what the uh, that's the sort of school that we 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 see in the media often no children at all but you know you can see that that there is there is no possibility of of physical distancing uh, this this classroom actually has some windows that open most classrooms don't um, and it's extremely difficult to uh, get air through particularly the modern buildings where they have sealed units um, for uh, for other reasons I have an office like that when I go to the office. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, more pictures of classrooms. Wonderful. And uh, I think I'll finish there. Thanks, Tony. That's great. OK, so we'll move on to questions. And I know that, Sammy, you wanted to just explain a little bit about your campaign as well. Um, and I think probably we'll be starting questions with you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Yes, yeah, so we would just like to talk about our concerns with over testing um, of children and how many children are likely to be infectious and um, and testing and positive with COVID and not getting picked up on testing. Uh, lots of our parents report that they physically can't get the swab into their child's nose because the swab is too big for testing and then they're getting negative tests even though the child seems to have symptoms. Um, we have uh, an issue with the criteria for testing. Children often present with different symptoms to adults and the website uh, questions that um, the criteria that they say you have to meet to be allowed a free test don't actually accommodate for the symptoms that children present with. Um, and that's a great concern to us because uh, decisions in health and education are made on the statistics of how many children are infected. And we feel that there it's very likely that a large number of children are unfortunately um, positive with COVID and being missed from the from statistics. So we have a campaign running um, that we were asking parents to sign that asks the government to create an awareness campaign that helps parents spot coronavirus 
teaches them about the symptoms that children present with, which are often very different to the, the adult symptoms, um, and also explains the, um, sadly, some of the, the more complex issues that coronavirus can give. So things like the multi-inflammatory um, sy uh, syn syndrome and, um, and also, um, lost my train of thought now, <laughs> and also uh, the uh, long COVID that um, lots of our children have. We've now got over 450 families that have multiple children with long COVID. Many of those families were ill in March, April, and their children are still not well enough to attend school or attend school permanently. So um, we've got some children that haven't actually been back to school since they got infected. Other children attending two or three um, hours a day, some children attending only um, remotely. So that's an ongoing concern. Um, so we have a couple of questions, uh, three questions actually, that have come from our group. And then we'd like to um, give uh, the general public options to, to ask questions. Um, one of them is, how much is known about the difference between the old and new variant? So is there a big difference that we need to be aware of? So, from my point of view, well, I'm, I'm not a virologist. It's not not the area I really research on, but I, I follow a lot of virologists and, and people who research this kind of thing. And it it seems pretty clear that it is more contagious and that's the main difference, right? That it seems to cause similar disease, similar mortality, whatever. But it is just fifty percent more contagious. It's, and the problem is this is uh, this is like compound interest. If you have 50% more interest on a loan, over time you will pay a lot, a lot more money. So, so that's what makes it very dangerous. So all of the things that, uh, that I mentioned that we need to do to control the virus that before we, we were squeaking by, we were getting some waves, now it's gonna be much more difficult. So, so things, I mean, I totally agree with what, what you said about, about the schools. I mean, I think I, I'm lucky here, my son who's six years old, he has had the option the whole year whether to attend online or in person. I mean, sometimes everybody's online because there are five cases. And right now they are all online because there was a case in his school. Again, that's very common over here. Um, but during some of the time, they, you can choose to bring your kid in person or, or have, it, have them be online. And our kid has been online because we have a person at risk at home. So basically, I totally agree with, with everything you, you guys said. Thank you. I am sorry can i just add to the the genetics part of that um because i've been following that reasonably closely uh the 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 uh the lineage they call them not variants but we get variant in the uh, press all the time the lineage in the that was identified first in the uk a bit, uh, as jose said uh, is appears to be a lot more transmissible the the lineages that are appearing in south africa and nigeria and brazil um, they contain a mutation called uh, E474K, I think it is, uh, which is a non, uh, I think it's a non-synonymous uh, mutation, uh, which means it changes the protein and the way the, it, what, the way it acts on the spike protein. And I think that's a, a much more worrying um, a trend. And I think these new mutations and these new lineages that are appearing have been a consequence of um, allowing the virus to, to, to be in such large uh, prevalence in, in, in populations. In the countries that have zero COVID approaches where there's a much less prevalence in those countries, they're less likely to see those uh, mutations occur and get um, preferred um, in terms of uh, natural selection. So. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have um, that's come in from a parent is, what advice would you give to schools based on the knowledge of the new variant? And I guess we've covered that really in, in what we've already discussed. And then the final question that we have is, um, can children aid transmission via pollination? So essentially, are they able to carry the virus on their clothes, on their school bags, if people have been breathing on them and bring that home? Is that a, is that a concern that parents should be considering? Um, so we call that the technical term is aerosolized fomite. So fomite is what's on your surface. And then um, it's possible, and there is a study where they painted hamster with flu virus and then they, some of them got infected. But um, I think every scientist I've talked to thinks it's unlikely. because The, the virus, once it's exposed, is decaying and it's, and it's hard to get it back in the air. You know, so, I mean, I think what, what, uh, what people were saying is like, for someone who works in a hospital that, you know, people are coughing on you, whatever, yeah, change your clothes when you go home. Or if you are in a place really with, with a lot of people and, 
where ventilation is poor, but otherwise, I, you know, I wouldn't spend a ton of effort with that. I think it's, it's much more important to make sure they have good masks, they wear them well, that the school enforces that, that there is ventilation and all these other things. Thank you. And then I have one question. Um, would the uh, the way that um, the amount of viral uh, virus that someone breathes in, could that contribute to some of the reasons why some of the children and families are not getting better and have the, the long COVID? Mm. Mm. Well, th there is there seems to be some discussion that th if you if you breathe in, if you get a lot more virus, you may develop a more serious case. I've seen this more discussed in terms of serious cases that you end up in a ventilator, not so much about long COVID. So that I, I have not seen the studies about that. It's, it's plausible. I mean, the, the more virus you get, the, the less able your body is to cope. So this is another reason to always be, be putting all these lines of defense because maybe, maybe we cannot avoid getting infected, but we can avoid a more serious disease and these more serious complications. So. I mean, in cases when we don't know, we always say you have to follow the precautionary principle. We don't know if, if more virus causes, causes long COVID, but it's possible that it does. It's completely plausible. So let's defend ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a question. You, uh, you saw our, our map um, and that we, and it's actually our team, it wasn't just me, um, painstakingly collated all of those reports that the public sent to us that they could find in newspapers or letters from schools, etc., telling us about cases in schools. Now, what we noticed when we read those was the change in policy about who should be isolated. So initially, right back in June, when we initially opened the schools and we have very few pupils in, whole classes or even whole schools were being tested were being sent home. The kids went back in September, lots of cases because then we've got them all in, in classes of 30 and year group bubbles as they're called of 200 children who are mixing in senior schools. And very quickly, the policy changed whereby those whole bubbles or whole classes weren't sent home, but instead a close contacts policy is being used. And in fact, our government is now trying to get away from even that by putting in lateral flow testing. Um, so the parents have the option to agree to that and keep the child in school rather than have them isolating if they're a close contact. And for the benefit of our audience, close contact is going to be somebody who is within one metre for a very short period of time or within two metres for over 15 minutes. And that's considered sufficient to allow somebody to isolate. And other than that, generally, unless there are a lot of cases in a class, you're not seeing bubbles being sent home. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that, Professor, because I know what I think, but how, how do you see that in terms of the appropriateness of that policy? Um, well, I, I've seen similar things in, in, in other countries, but for example, as I said, there was a case in my kid's school and the whole class is, is, being, is quarantining, right? So it's, so it's variable. I mean, I think the, it's probably like I was saying earlier, it's more of a political decision. It has been decided that we want to keep schools open and if we isolate everybody, then there will be so many people in isolation that you don't accomplish the political objective of keeping the schools open. Um, I mean, I think of course, people who are closer have a higher chance of, of being infected, but um, you know, you, what you can expect with a disease like this is you have some positive case and in four out of five cases, nobody gets infected. But in one case, five other kids get infected, right? So I think they also use examples in which, well, there was nobody got infected as, as if that was the norm. If nobody got infected, then we wouldn't have a pandemic, right? So I, I mean, I think it's wrong and it's, it's a political decision. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't got ventilation in schools as we would like to have, as Tony mentioned, many windows don't open very far, etc. So it's very difficult. Um, but I think we've picked up some really good ideas tonight about, for example, the meters. I think that was fantastic and may well be picked up by schools. Um, I wanted to bring our Jenny in from Parents United. I think you've got a 
a whole batch of questions that you're probably going to have to sort through and find something. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I picked up some questions from the group for you. Thank um, you. A lot of them, I think you have already begun to answer. Actually, they came in kind of uh, before or early on. Um, one person would like to know when children and staff are not wearing masks and they're not isol um, they're not distancing from one another. Is having a couple of windows open going to be enough in the classroom to significantly reduce the risk of transmission? <laughs> well, it, it would be much better if they distance and they wore masks, obviously. I mean, these are, these are layers of protection. Each layer helps, but you need many layers because none of, there is no silver bullet, basically, right? So now ventilation will help, even if you don't do the other things, ventilation will help because, because I mean, you can imagine in the choir case that they, they showed how they opened the windows a little bit, less people will have gotten infected. Still some people will have gotten infected, right? If they were not wearing masks and doing everything else the same, but every one of the measures does help. So it, so it does help to, to do some ventilation, but of course, I mean, wearing masks should be mandatory in my opinion. Thank you. Just leading on from that. Um, Another parent asks, face masks, should they be worn by children and staff inside? And also, are they needed outside for playtime as well? De definitely inside. I mean, I think here, in, again, in, in Boulder in the US, they are mandatory for kids six and older, and they are optional or as much as you can for kids three to six. You know, it's, um, I have a six-year-old and you know, it's not his favorite activity to wear the masks, but he's he's tolerated it when, when he has to. And outdoors. So it's always indoors when we're sharing the air, right? With other people, that's the dangerous situation. Outdoors, we saw that there is also some transmission, but it's really when people are talking close to each other for a while. Or if you imagine that this person is smoking and the smoke is going to you because the air is going that way, that's a dangerous situation. So I would say outdoors, if you can keep your distance, um, you know, if you are, you know, if you are in the middle of a field and you're walking and you are, you know, 50 meters from someone else, you don't need it. This, this is not a, a movie, an American movie thing that the virus comes in the air. You know, it, it's really, you have to help the virus. It's not so contagious. The problem is we're helping it all the time, but you have to talk to someone outdoors without a mask to really get infected. So, so if you are outdoors or you are close to the people you're talking, yes. If you are keeping more distance, then, then it's not. It's not so important. Thank you. Uh, and just leading on from that, um, somebody would like to know what do you think the minimum space requirements are um, per person uh, to, to be safe from aerosol, aerosol transmission? There is no safe distance. So the, um, there is, I mean, there is this, um, when you're in close proximity and you imagine again, smelling someone's garlic or or, the, or breathing the smoke that's coming out of someone. So then if you are less than a meter, it's very dangerous. If you're less than two meters, there is some enhanced transmission. But then you transition into this thing where you're sharing the air through the room. You are not breathing the air that's just coming out of that person, but you are just in a smoky room, right? And then there is no safe distance. As I said, in the choir, someone was 14 meters behind and they still got infected. And everybody got infected, everyone in the room, right? So. Uh, for, for that, only ventilation helps or being outdoors, right? Of course, I mean, distance always helps, you know, it will reduce it a little bit, but it's not going to make it safe. You're not going to be, oh, because I'm, there are some, I don't know if in the UK people do this, that the people go into offices and because they can keep their distance, they remove the mask. This is a mistake, you know, this is because you can still get infected by sharing the air. Can I just add to that, Jenny? Yeah, please so, um we do have our traffic light um, system recommendations about when we have uh, higher numbers of cases in an area, then schools should operate on a basis of having fewer children in a classroom. Now, that's part of that is about social distancing. So it's about those larger droplets in that case, isn't it? But also, Tony, as Tony will tell us, it's about that statistical risk of how many people you get uh, infected potentially in that room. Um, so I understand what you're saying from the point of view of there is no safe distance if that room is filled. However, the number of people in that room is still an important factor because the chances that one of them is going to be infected is higher the more of them there are. 
and the more of them they're going to infect because they're in the same room as them. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we don't we don't lose that as well, because I think those numbers of people in class are vitally important. Totally in agreement with what you said. Um, I guess this kind of leads on from that. Um, somebody would like to know uh, about the bubble system that we have in, in UK schools here. I don't know how familiar you are with our with our bubbles. Um, they'd like to know how helpful they actually are. Um, they've asked, are they helpful bubbles, uh, which is kind of, you know, children in one class sticking together um, and not interacting with, with anybody else in the school, um, or are they more of a hindrance? No, they're, they're very helpful, and this, this is well known from epidemiology that, that um, if you have less contact with, with other people and your contacts are with a restricted group, then the chances that one of those are infected is lower than if you interact with the whole school. So it's a good idea to the extent that it's put in practice properly, right? If, if, if really the contacts are limited in that way and, and it's, it's done well, then it is useful. Of course, if you are unlucky enough that someone in the bubble is infected, then you know that but but that's the idea that you are in contact with 10 or 20 kids instead of 200. Mm -hmm. uh, but sorry can I just add to that and the previous point that the, this is the point of the zero covid approach aggressively controlling the prevalence in in a, a particular environment in a particular country or locality means that you have fewer cases and this is a probability game that there, there is one person in a hundred or a thousand infected and then you're playing probabilities and that's why you need to reduce the number of children in classes, make sure there's enough air going through that room, but also get the virus under control in the first place. And we have failed to do that. We even failed in the summer. We had case rate, case rise, cases rising in the UK from the middle of July. I tracked it right from uh, the word go and they were rising from July. Uh, and, and it's a total failure what we've, what we've seen in the past few weeks. Thanks, Tony. Right, a, a couple more questions, Jenny, and then I think we might be done. Brilliant. Um, somebody would like to know uh, the PV screens that some schools are putting on you know, children's desks, are they helpful at all? Waste of money. The, I mean, the, those, those screens will, I mean, if a kid is coughing constantly, but then they shouldn't be in school, right? And I think I trust those kids are identified and sent home. Um, those really, I mean, the, the idea is that imagine that someone is smoking and you put all those screens around, would, you, would those protect you from smelling the smoke? No, that's a waste of money. I mean, they should invest, um, I mean, my university bought a ton of plexiglass, we call it here, and then we told them, don't use it. And they have donated it to the arts department that they are now making all kinds of things. We call this plexiglass. And the only situation in which is useful is in a teller situation, like a cashier, if you have someone like a cashier in a supermarket or something that is constantly talking to someone else, that's good because they break the flow of air and if there is any droplets or, you know, that is useful, you know, when you're gonna pay for something. But but in a classroom to surround everything, they can, I mean, in case they can even hurt a little bit because they, they trap the air. So, so yeah, no, that's not useful at all. Thank you. Um, and just a final question to end on, and I think I'll open this out to, to everybody um, on the panel. Uh, I think you, several of you might want to have a go at answering it. Um, somebody has asked, uh, why do you think the government don't want to accept aerosol transmission, particularly in schools? I'll, I'll let you guys answer. You know that your government. <laughs> you, you, have a, you have an interesting government too, uh, hopefully. <laughs> so we, can't, we can play government games here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, yes, it's it's too dangerous. And actually, I'll use the uh, example of the US uh, because the Center for Disease Control um, tried to slip in um, something about aerosol transmission as the primary method of transmission in September or October, and it was taken out and it was a political decision, a political intervention which took that out. It was put back in, I think, after the election result in the States here it's not being talked about and it really it really is disastrous that we're not talking about it because it's clear that the super spreading incidents have all been inside in the summer we had lots of um, collections of people outside on beaches on uh, you know on protest marches 
there were no super spreading incidents uh, linked to those events. If, if it was uh, transmissible outside, uh, there, there would have been super spreading incidents there. The major ones around the world have been, as, as I said, as in churches, especially choirs, um, re other religious uh, gatherings. But, uh, uh, in the early days in India, there was one in New Delhi um, with a, an evangelical um, a Muslim uh, Islamic group, I think it was. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, um, we noticed um, through the summer in factories, uh, in offices, uh, in apartment blocks, uh, in hospitals, in care homes, in schools, in universities. They're all inside crowded areas, prisons as well. I forgot prisons. So, you know, all of these places have a, something in common. And uh, I think Jose has done a brilliant job explaining the, the science. By the way, I wanted to just quickly ask you about the Florida study. We used the Florida hotel, uh, sorry, hospital room study, which was a, an aerosol study. I, I, you probably recall the details a bit more than I do. And, and that was, for me, as a, as a statistician who works in biological science, that was the killer study that it demonstrated it must be aerosols. Could you make a comment about it? Yeah, yeah. So in that study, they were, <clears throat> they were sampling the air and they, then they took the, the air that they had sampled and they put it over cells and they saw that there was virus, it was the COVID-19 virus, and that it could grow in the cells. There was infectious virus which is something that the WHO and others were saying, oh, that's not gonna happen, whatever. And, and it was demonstrated and it's, it's really a smoking gun, as, as you would say that, yeah, the disease, and, and because it was five meters from the patient. So it was clear that that is transmitted that way. And, you know, even diseases that they do admit they like, go through the air like measles or tuberculosis, never in the history of medicine have they been able to do like what that Florida study that. Nobody has ever captured room air taken measles virus and made it grow, or the same with tuberculosis, right? So it's actually a really difficult thing to do and it has been done, but, but then for political reasons, they keep dismissing it. It's like, well, we don't know if it's enough. It was infectious, you know, things like that, which makes no sense. But. Thank you. I would just um, say on the government question to backtrack a little, that we have seen a report from Independent Sage um, back in September that did acknowledge for office workers that aerosol transmission was a problem. And they even gave figures of how much um, space people should have, what about air exchange, um, and how many people an infected person in an office environment could be expected to infect. And we also saw a public health campaign in the run up to Christmas, trying to persuade the public that they needed to open their windows because of aerosol transmission in the home, because they were concerned about the policy of having relatives round uh, over the Christmas period. So it is somewhat in the public domain, but we need it in the public domain with regard to schools, we would suggest. I'm gonna bring it to a close now. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, most especially, thank you, Jose, it was an amazing presentation and we're really looking forward to helping uh, spread that message even further. We will put the live onto um, our YouTube channel and it will also go on to Long COVID Kids um, YouTube channel. And we will put some useful links in there, for example, to Jose's slides. Thanks as well to our audience and for all your questions. Um, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you very much for the invitation and for your time. You're welcome, oh. thank you. It's, it's wonderful to uh, meet you. Uh, I just checked, I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> of course you do. Hi.